first I have to brag, I have a Mises t-shirt also, a different one from the United States, and thanks for your Mises t-shirt. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to answer one question that was put to me yesterday after my lecture on uh, evictionism. Somebody said, well, uh, if you invite somebody on your airplane and then you're 30 feet high, 30,000 feet high, you can't say, just leave. Uh, therefore, the pregnant woman can't just say to the fetus, just leave. And my point was that this is a disanalogy because if you invite someone onto a plane, the implicit contract or the implicit promise is you'll put them back down on the earth safely or give them a parachute or something. However, with intercourse, let me explain how this works. <laughs> there is, we said that the fetus is a human being, but at the time of intercourse, there's no human being. The sperm is here, the egg is there. It takes a while for the sperm to get to the egg. Then there's a fetus. So at the time of intercourse, there's no invitation. So it's a disanalogy. Okay, today my topic is Milton Friedman. I was having dinner last night, uh, and somebody said that in most bookstores and in most universities in uh, Brazil and everywhere else in the U.S. as well, uh, all the books are Marxist or Keynesian. And every once in a while, there's a little bit of Milton Friedman. And this is true everywhere. Milton Friedman is seen as the exemplar of free enterprise. And to some extent, it's true. You know, they say that where there's smoke, there's fire. There must be some truth to it. And Milton Friedman is very, very good on some issues. For example, he favors uh, getting rid of rent control. He's very good on minimum wage. He doesn't like minimum wage law. He's very, very, very good on international trade, freedom of trade. Uh, in his Free to Choose series, he talks about Hong Kong having a unilateral declaration of free trade with everyone, no tariffs, no quotas. So, and on uh, occupational licensure, he is also uh, very good. So Milton Friedman is, favors free enterprise in certain areas. But in other areas, he's not so good. I would say that of the three people who have converted more people to libertarianism or free enterprise than anyone else, I would say is Ayn Rand, Ron Paul, and Milton Friedman. So I have to give credit to Milton Friedman. He is uh, favors free enterprise in many important areas. However, uh, I resist the notion that he is the uh, spokesman for free enterprise or libertarianism because on many other areas he's not so good. And what I'm going to focus on today is not so much I've already mentioned his uh, uh, favoring of free enterprise, but now I'm going to mention where he violates free enterprise. So the first one is antitrust. Now yesterday I gave you my antitrust joke. Today I'll just mention that he favors antitrust. And the problem with antitrust is, you see, ordinarily, when trade occurs, we are entitled to deduce from the fact that trade occurred that both parties gained. So I buy the watch for $20. We can deduce that I valued the watch more than $20. And the person who sold me the watch valued it less. So there's mutual gain in the ex ante sense. Ex post, afterward, is usually gain, but not necessarily. What antitrust says is not when a trade occurs, there is mutual benefit. It says when a trade doesn't occur, uh, this is wrong. So for example, Djokovic is the best tennis player now in the world. And let's say he plays 20 tournaments a year. The antitrust people would say they would draw a supply curve and a cost curve, and they say he should uh, play 30 tournaments a year. Therefore, he's cheating us out of 10 tournaments a year. And they prove through their econometric analysis, which is just nonsense, that the extra 10 uh, tournaments he could play are less cost to him than value to us. And where do they get that from? <coughs> Who knows? 
<clears throat> in most uh, mainstream economic texts, in the first chapter, they talk about costs as the opportunity cost or the alternative foregone. So what is the cost of you people attending this lecture? Uh, part of it might be money if you had to pay for the lecture. Part of it could be what else you could have been doing if you weren't listening to the lecture. And we didn't even know what it was, and you weren't even thinking about it until I mentioned it. It might be swimming or eating or sleeping or working at a job. Who knows? Then later on in the fifth chapter, they have these cost curves. And what they do is they give Djokovic or IBM a cost curve which is arbitrary and capricious, and they say based on this cost curve and based on a demand curve, Djokovic should be playing 10 more tournaments a year or uh, IBM should produce more uh, computers. And how they manufacture this is just uh, uh, unsupported. And Friedman supports this. Friedman would put people in jail for not producing enough. And what I'm saying is when you produce, we can deduce things from that mutual gain. But when you don't produce, we can't, produce, uh, we can't uh, uh, deduce anything from that. Like right now, nobody made a bicycle. None of you are in the business of making bicycles. And I can't say anything on the basis of that. I can't say you should be making bicycles. But that's what antitrust does, and Milton Friedman favors this. However, he's a little bit better than the lefties, because the lefties would say, if you have a big market share, uh, have antitrust. And Friedman says, well, antitrust costs money. And the only time you should pursue antitrust is if the dead weight loss, the, the loss of not producing enough, is bigger than the costs. So this is a, a little bit of free enterprise, but it's not very free enterprise. The second one is the negative income tax. A positive income tax means you make uh, $30,000, you pay $10,000, that's 30% uh, tax. Negative income tax is if you make less than a certain amount, the difference, let's say everyone should make 10,000 and you only make uh, nothing, well, the negative income tax is say 30% of 10,000, the government gives you money. So it's like a welfare program. <coughs> only now you would have a right to this based on the tax system. And Friedman favors taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. How is this free enterprise? It's hard to see. Another issue is I once wrote an article uh, on Hayek's Road to Serfdom. And Road to Serfdom has got good things, but Hayek gives away the store. He uh, compromises with socialism all over the place. So I wrote an essay uh, criticizing him which was a little awkward because Hayek was very nice with my first book, Defending the Undefendable. He wrote uh, a forward to that book comparing me to Mises. And I was, you know, 25 years old. And not that I deserved being compared to Mises even now, but it was very nice. And I was sort of biting the hand that feeds me uh, in attacking Hayek. But I think that um, if you're a good professor, you want your students to criticize you and get at the truth. How else do we get at the truth unless we can criticize each other? So anyway, I wrote this article on Hayek, and Milton Friedman wrote an essay saying, uh, Block is all wrong. And we had back and forth maybe four or five times, and uh, I was trying to convince Milton Friedman to take up free enterprise. I didn't succeed. Uh, maybe a little bit. Who knows? OK, the next one is tax withholding. Tax withholding means if there's no withholding, then at the end of the year, you have to pay money. So if you make 30000 a year and you have to pay $10,000, let us say the tax rate is uh, one-third or 33%, you have to pay $10,000 all at once. And if you have to pay $10,000 all at once, you start saying, whoa, what am I getting for this $10,000? Uh, and people are reluctant to pay so much money. So Milton Friedman's <coughs> scheme was let's take a little bit of money out each week so that it's relatively painless to pay taxes. It doesn't, you don't realize how much taxes you're paying. And then at the end of the year, sometimes the government gives money back because you pay too much taxes and people say, well, taxes aren't so bad. Look, government is giving us money back. So this is hardly free enterprise, helping the government become more efficient at uh, taxing us. Look, if something is bad, we don't want it to be more efficient. We want it to be less efficient. And taxes are bad, so here Milton Friedman is making it more efficient. 
Speaking of which, the next one on my list, I have a list of about 15 things. Next one is the volunteer military, getting rid of the military draft. Now you might think this is a good thing. This is libertarian because the draft is coercive and the draft uh, is compulsory and you have to uh, go fight the <clears throat> Vietnamese uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, Muhammad Ali, the boxer, once said, no Vietnamese ever called me the N-word. You know what the N-word is? Uh, 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 a slur at, at black people. Uh, thank you. I, I don't know what the, what the word is. And uh, so Muhammad Ali didn't want to go fight the, the Vietnamese. And as a libertarian, uh, I think that the, if we have governments, and we shouldn't, but if we have, they shouldn't go attack other places and, and create wars. It's just imperial, imperialism. So anyway, Milton Friedman wants to have an end to the draft and to have a voluntary military, which sounds good. But the reason he wants to do it is to make the US Army more efficient. And if the US Army is doing good things, like defending the country, OK. But if the US government is attacking other countries that haven't first attacked the United States, this is not good. And Milton Friedman is favoring getting rid of the draft in order to make the US imperialist army more efficient. So I, as I say, if something is bad, we don't want to make it more efficient. Not that we want to, uh, if anything, make it less efficient. So that's another problem that I have with Milton Friedman from a libertarian point of view. The next thing I have is uh, uh, road socialism. Uh, I uh, once called Milton Friedman a socialist. He didn't like this because he favored uh, government roads. And I spoke about government roads the other day, yesterday, I think it was. And uh, Milton Friedman favors the, the government roads, and I think we should not have government roads. So this is yet another instance where Milton Friedman is not really for free enterprise. The next one is money. Why do we have money? The reason we have money, and the reason barter is no good, is because of a thing called the double coincidence of wants. So let's suppose I have a chicken, and I want a pickle. The odds of finding someone who has a pickle and wants a chicken are very low. It would be a coincidence to find someone like that. So instead of looking for someone who has a, a pickle and wants a chicken, I take my chicken and I trade it to this man here for salt. Because everyone wants salt, or coffee, or tea, or something that everyone wants. And then I take the salt, or the coffee, or the tea, and I go buy a pickle. So various things can uh, intermediate the trade, can overcome the double coincidence of wants, salt, sugar, coffee. Uh, bananas wouldn't be good because bananas go bad after a few days. Diamonds are not good money because when you break them up to make change, they lose value. Two small diamonds are not worth what one big diamond is worth. Cement is not a good money because you need so much cement to conduct business, it's hard to carry it around. So when there was a competition as to which item would become the intermediation of trade, namely money, that's what money is, is to facilitate trade, and usually gold won out because gold is valuable, you can break up gold, it's hard to fake gold, people can tell real gold from non-gold. So when people were free to choose, they chose gold, sometimes silver. Now Milton Friedman has this t television series called Free to Choose. It's a very good series. You, people should watch that. But when people were free to choose, they chose gold. And does Friedman support gold? No, he supports fiat money. F government money. Now, why does the government want to pr uh, produce money? Why does the government want to be in charge of money? Uh, this is a joke. There was a guy named Willie Sutton who was a bank robber. And Willie Sutton was once asked, why do you ba rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. <laughs> why does the government want to have fiat currency or government money? That's where the money is. Because there are only three ways for the government to get money. One is to tax. And the problem with taxing from the government's point of view is everyone knows who's doing it. They can't blame private enterprise. 
They can't blame uh, entrepreneurial greed. The second one is borrowing. And uh, everyone knows who's borrowing and who's pushing out other people who want to borrow. And it also raises the interest rate. The third way is to print money. But if there's a gold standard, the government can't print money. The government can't create money. So that's why they, they want to have fiat US uh, uh, government currency and Friedman is supporting them. The next one is the Fed, the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is the central planning bureau for money. But we don't need a central planning bureau for agriculture as they had in the uh, Soviet Union and we don't need one for money. We uh, libertarians favor free enterprise. Therefore, as Ron Paul says, we should end the Fed. And what is Milton Friedman's view on the Fed? Keep the Fed. Now, it's true, he doesn't want the Fed to be very creative. He wants to limit the Fed to increasing the money supply by 2 or 3% because he has this fetish. He's a pervert. He has this fetish that prices should be the same. And since productivity is increasing by 2 or 3% a year, if the money supply increases by 2 or 3% a year, prices will be level. But why should prices be level? Why shouldn't prices come down? What's wrong with that? When televisions first came out, they cost a lot of money. And then as they produced them, the prices came down. When computers first came out, a computer was as big as this whole building here. And it cost uh, millions of dollars. And now computers are this big and they cost much less. So what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that as far as libertarians or Austrian economists are concerned. Uh, let me just mention a little bit about Austrian economics. My lecture tonight will be on Austrian economics. And Austrian economics has got nothing to do with the economics of the country Austria. It's just that the people who first started this school of thought, Menger, Bomberwerk, Mises, Hayek, all came from Austria. But the Austrian view is that when the Fed um, creates money, it lowers the interest rate. And when it lowers the interest rate, it misallocates resources. And I'll have more to say about that tonight when I talk about Austrian economics. And if I have time, I'll, I'll get into that. But I want to mention, a few, oh, the next one is flex, uh, the next one is flexible exchange rates. For example, the, uh, the Brazilian real, is that what, the Brazilian yeah. real and the United States dollar, he wants to uh, have exchange, uh, flexible exchanges. And uh, the Austrians or the libertarians want to have fixed exchange rates between the real and the dollar. And uh, Milton Friedman says, well, that's price control and we're against price control. And the answer that uh, comes from my side is, look, there's a fixed exchange rate between a dollar and a half dollar, right? Or between a nickel and a dime. And the reason for this is that the real should be a certain amount of gold and the dollar should be another amount of gold. And if it's, uh, let's say the dollar has twice as much gold as the real, of course you don't have a flexible exchange rate between a nickel and a dime or between the real and the dollar because it's just different amounts of gold. So. Here, Friedman uh, sounds like the free enterpriser, and Mises sounds like a, pr a price controller, but the reality is, is very different. Milton Friedman says, we're all Keynesians now. And I think he, he's correct. He is a Keynesian. He's a monetarist Keynesian, but he's a Keynesian. See, the, the difference between the Austrians and the mainstream is the mainstream thinks the economy is like a car and the car is supposed to stay on the road. But they think that the car is very unstable. Sometimes it goes into the ditch of inflation and sometimes it goes into the ditch of unemployment and the government has to steer the car. And when the uh, uh, economy, the car economy goes into inflation, that means the car is going too fast, you have to put the brakes on. And when the economy is going into unemployment on the other side of the road on the ditch, you have to put the gas pedal on. The only difference between the Keynesian Keynesians and the Friedmanite Keynesians 
is uh, one believes in fiscal policy, taxing and spending as the way to put the brakes on or the gas pedal on. And uh, Friedman believes in monetary policy as the way to put the gas on or the brakes on. Thank you. What Milton Friedman said and, and Paul Samuelson quoted Friedman as saying is that when it comes to the uh, public policy analysis, there is a great chasm, a great difference between us and the Keynesians. But when it comes to the tools of analysis, <clears throat> we're all Keynesians now. Well, which is more important, the public policy implications or the tools of analysis? I think the tools of analysis because <clears throat> the public policy comes from the tools of analysis, namely how do you look at the economy. So Milton Friedman is a Keynesian. And what I'm trying to do is say that even though Milton Friedman favors free enterprise in some ways, in other ways his credentials as a free enterpriser are, are limited. The next one is educational vouchers. Milton Friedman believes very strongly in two things. One is the Fed and the other is educational vouchers. And um, educational vouchers means that we should have competition between public schools. You see, in the, I don't know how it is in, in Brazil, but in the United States, you have to go to the local public school. And if you live here, you go to this school, and if you live here, you go to that school. So people move to get to a better school, which is difficult. And Friedman says, let's give everyone a voucher, which is a, a permit to go to school for a certain amount of money. And then we can have competition between public schools to make the public schools better. But the libertarian doesn't want to make the public schools better. The libertarian wants to get rid of public schools and have private schools. Look, suppose government were in charge of restaurants. All the restaurants were government. And they were pretty lousy as we would expect government restaurants to be because there's no competition. Now, the libertarian answer would be privatize all the restaurants. That's it. Private restaurants, give this restaurant to him, give this restaurant to him, and that's it. Whereas uh, Friedman's scheme would be, let's leave the restaurants public and now let's have people have a competition between public restaurants. This is maybe a step in the right direction, maybe not. It's very complicated to see if it is a step in the right direction. Because on the one hand, the public schools will get better, but on the other hand, the private schools will get worse. Because now people can go to the private schools with their vouchers, and the private schools have to accept them. So it's, uh, it's a horse race to see whether this is actually uh, beneficial toward liberty or away from liberty. It's very complicated. <coughs> Whereas the free market point of view would be privatize all the schools. Schools should be just like restaurants or wristwatches or t-shirts. You want to have a school? Set up a school. You need a school? Go pay for a school. And that's it. Whereas for Friedman, somehow education is different. Well, this is not exactly the free enterprise point of view. The next one is uh, uh, Ronald Coase. Everyone, anyone here of Ronald Coase? C-O-A-S-E. He also won a Nobel Prize. He's not as famous as Milton Friedman outside of economics, but inside of economics he's maybe even more well-known, although it's hard to know, but he is very, very well-known. <coughs> and uh, in uh, economic discipline, to become a professor and to get promotion, you have to publish in referee journals. But more than publishing in referee journals, you have to be cited by other people in other referee journals and other books. So a citation index is very important. Ronald Coase's article, he didn't write that many articles, only about seven or eight articles. But the one on social costs is the most heavily cited article of any article in, in economics. So Ronald Coase is very, very famous within economics and very well accomplished because everyone cites this. So let me talk just for a few minutes about Ronald Coase and Milton Friedman now supports him, so I'm, I'm attacking Milton Friedman for supporting Ronald Coase. Uh, Ronald Coase has uh, two views. One is we have zero transactions cost. What's a transaction cost? Not the cost of making this chair, paying for the labor, paying for the factory, but the cost of getting it to the consumer. 
making a contract, finding a consumer, things like that. That's what a transactions cost is. And Ronald Coe says that in a zero transactions cost world, it doesn't matter what the judge says in, a, in the case of a dispute. Okay, so I'm going to have another dispute. Again, your name? Gabriel. Gabriel. I'm going to have a dispute with Gabriel as to who is the owner of these shoes. Gabriel now has these shoes on his foot, but the, I'm now claiming uh, those are my shoes. And what Ronald Coe says that in the zero transactions cost world, it doesn't matter who the judge awards the shoes to, it'll go to the person who values it most. So let's say Gabriel values the shoes at $100 and I value the shoes at $10. So if the uh, judge awards me the shoes, will I keep the shoes? No. Because Gabriel will offer me $50 for the shoes because I only value it at 10 and I'll accept 50 for the shoes that I value at 10. I'll make a profit of uh, 40. And he values the shoes at 100 and he'll pay 50, so he'll, he'll make 50. You understand that? That if the judge awards it to him, uh, to me, he'll get the shoes anyway. Now, suppose the judge awards the shoes to him. Will I be able to bribe him out of the shoes? No, I only value it at 10. He values at 100. I'm not going to offer him 110. At 110, he would sell me the <coughs> shoes, but, not, but I only value it at 10. So again, he will keep the shoes. That's the zero transactions cost world. Now, let's take the real world where you have a very, very high uh, transactions cost. Think in terms of 10,000 polluters of air and uh, a million uh, victims of pollution and for them to make a deal it would be impossible. So now the question is if the, we have high transactions costs, who should uh, be awarded the right? Should the polluter or the polluter have the right? The polluter to pollute or the polluter to stop the pollution or Gabriel to have the shoes or me to have the shoes? And what Coe says is, in the high transactions cost world, if there's a dispute between me and Gabriel over those shoes, give the sh he tells the judge, give the shoes to whoever who values it more. And we know Gabriel values it at 100, I value it at 10, so they would give him the shoes. Namely, what the judge is asked to do is to look into the future and whoever will make the most use of the shoes should get it because the idea for Coase and Friedman is to maximize the GDP, maximize wealth. Whereas the libertarian view would look at it very differently. The libertarian would not look to the future and say who can make the best use of the shoes. Rather, what the libertarian would do is look to the past and ask who has a bill of sale for the shoes? Now, these shoes are Gabriel's shoes. He has a picture of him a month ago or a year ago or 10 years ago. You should really get new shoes. They're 10 years old. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> he has a bill of sale or his parents gave him the shoes or, or something. And, and now the judge asks, well, what is my claim to his shoes? And my claim to the shoes is I like them. And namely, what, what this is doing is violating justice. They're going to give me the shoes if I can prove I value it more. Let's suppose I value the shoes more than him. The judge will give me his shoes, which is a violation of property rights. And property rights are the basis of the economy. Look, suppose you have, here's a case from Coase. Suppose you have the cows that are going into the corn. Who, uh, should the uh, fence be built by the cows or, or the corn guy? And according to Coase, it depends upon the, the price of meat and corn. But the price of meat and corn keeps fluctuating. Every day it's different. So one day the, the, cow, the cattle man has to pay for the fence. The next day the corn field has to pay for the fence. Namely, there's no property rights. <coughs> At least under communism, there was property rights. The bourgeoisie were no good, the proletariat was good. It's not a good theory of property rights, but it's a theory of property rights. With Coase, there's no theory of property rights. And Friedman supports Coase. So Friedman, in, in rejecting property rights, is rejecting free enterprise because free enterprise is based on property rights.
One last one, neighborhood effects, externalities. Friedman favors subsidies for education. Or, uh, let, let's take education. You see, why do people want education? And Friedman says, well, there are private reasons and then there are public reasons. The private reasons are you'll get a better job, uh, the, you'll enjoy learning, you'll meet a better spouse, you'll meet better friends. These are the private reasons for education. And based on this, you have a certain demand curve and a certain supply curve, and you'll have a certain amount of education. But then Milton Friedman says there are external benefits or free riders, namely, if we're better educated, we'll vote more rationally or uh, we'll be less likely to be criminals. But we don't take those benefits into account. Therefore, we're not having enough education and in order to have more uh, rational allocation of resources, we should uh, give a subsidy to education. This is Milton Friedman's view. And my view, or the libertarian view, is this is just theft. Because what you're doing is you're taking money away from people who have no children in school and you're giving the money to families where there are children in school. And if this isn't outright theft, stealing, then nothing is. And yet Milton Friedman is justifying this. And I would say, even if it were true, even if there were these spillover benefits or free riders as they call it in economics, still it's not justified to force people to take money from some people and to give money to other people. Now let's take the case of the minimum wage law and rent control. Where are these the most popular in the United States? They're the most popular in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor, where there are a lot of universities. In the People's Republic, I'm kidding about that, of Cambridge, Massachusetts, where there are a lot of universities in the uh, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles where there are a lot of universities. Namely, students are being miseducated. They go to school and they learn Marxism, or they learn feminism, or they learn queer studies, or black studies, or resentment studies, or sociology, which is the same thing, <laughs> or, or history, or political science, or even economics, although well, economics is probably better than many of these other things. Namely, according to the Milton Friedman logic, what, what education is, is not a positive externality, but a negative externality. So according to the Friedman logic, we ought to tax education, not subsidize it. Namely, I'm, I'm trying to make a reductio ad absurdum. I'm using the logic of Friedman to come up with the exact opposite of what he says. So not only is what he say uh, immoral or anti-libertarian, but it's not even good economics. Okay, I've uh, exhausted my list of things uh, uh, negative about Milton Friedman. Let me just summarize again. I have 10 more minutes or so, and maybe we can have discussion about anything you want about Friedman or about anything I said yesterday or anything in Austrian economics or libertarianism if you want. Uh, what I'm saying is, yes, Friedman made a positive contribution in certain microeconomic areas. Minimum wage, free trade, rent control, uh, occupational licensure. He was very good on doctors don't have to have licenses. We should have a market there. Uh, he, he's sort of schizophrenic. Uh, in certain areas, he's very good. In other areas, he's horrible. So uh, I think that would be an accurate assessment of Milton Friedman's contribution to economics and to libertarianism. Thank you. Walter. Hilio. Yeah, I, would, I would think that uh, if uh, Milton were, were here, he would say to you the following, something along the lines of, uh, Walter, not only are you completely distorting everything I'm saying, but you, your bunch of crazy Austrians gathered together in Brazil, uh, are, are there spreading ideas, etc. I'm involved with public policy. And then here I'm trying to come up with the second best solution as compared to the third, to the fourth, and the fifth. But probably I think I like you in privatizing everything. So maybe you should discuss this more. How do you respond to that? 
Okay, that's a, a very good uh, defense of Milton Friedman, that I'm being theoretical, and maybe in theory I'm okay, but in practical reality, this is nuts, this is crazy, and Friedman was concerned with political reality. In this debate I had with Friedman over Hayek, his last letter was, Block, you're an extremist. And I said, look, your son David is an extremist too. He favors uh, anarchist, anarcho-capitalism. He didn't respond to that. First of all, even if what Helio says is true, and it's only partially true, even if it's true, my interest is not public policy. My interest is truth and justice. So sue me. I'm not that interested in, you know, uh, uh, let's have uh, uh, lower taxes but higher minimum wage or lower minimum wage and higher taxes. Ron Paul was known as Dr. No, because any time there was a bill, and a bill, uh, a legislative bill would have 15 things, if there was one thing wrong, he would say no. He didn't want to compromise and, and, and negotiate. He, if it was anything bad, he was against it. So I, I agree with Ron Paul. Secondly, the reason that this is not true is because on the minimum wage, <coughs> The reality of the minimum wage, now Rand Paul was once asked, well, should we raise the minimum wage? And he said, no, let's not raise the minimum wage. Let me just talk about the minimum wage a little bit. Uh, minimum wage, everyone thinks that you raise the minimum wage, you raise wages. No. You raise the minimum wage, and the minimum wage is not like a floor on the wages that are raising it. Rather, it's a barrier over which you have to jump to get a job in the first place, and the higher it is, the harder it is to get a job. So the political expediency, the political reality is Rand Paul, let's not raise the minimum wage. And then Rand Paul would say, well, should we get rid of it? And he said, well, we're not discussing that. But the reality is we should get rid of it, get rid of it entirely, and also put in jail the people responsible for it, but that's a whole other issue. But we should get rid of it. Now, if Milton Friedman were really practical, he wouldn't say, let's get rid of it, but he, he would say, get rid of it. Namely, he was magnificent on the minimum wage, on rent control, on free trade. He would say, get rid of all tariffs. That's not political reality. So Friedman can use as an excuse all these things that I've listed. I want to be realistic and political. But how about these other things where he's good on? He, he doesn't compromise there. So this couldn't be the explanation. That would be my response to him. Uh, the uh, n not mass murderer, uh, <laughs> serial murderer. Okay. Okay. So, so yesterday, a former economist known as Rodrigo Constantino said that Ron Paul was foolish and naive yeah. because he said he has stated that Bernie Sanders was more libertarian than, for instance, Ted Cruz. So, who would you have a take on that? Just for fun. Well. The, from a libertarian point of view, there are three areas that we concern ourselves with. One is economics, one is personal liberties, like prostitution, legalizing drugs, and the third is foreign policy. And I believe foreign policy is the most important, because foreign policy is like the dog, and economics is like the tail, namely the dog wags the tail, the tail doesn't wag the dog. Foreign policy is very important. And Bernie Sanders is pretty good on foreign policy, as is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is sort of like Taft. Uh, Donald Trump is saying, well, the US went into uh, Iraq and ruined Iraq. The US went into Libya, and now look at Libya. We shouldn't go in there. We shouldn't have all these wars, like Robert Taft. So Bernie Sanders is not so bad on foreign policy. He's horrible on economics, horrible on domestic policy, but not so bad on foreign policy. The same thing with Donald Trump. So if Ron Paul said that Bernie Sanders is better than Cruz, now Cruz, look, I favored Barack Obama over McCain in 08. Because I thought McCain was going to use a nuclear bomb on people, which would be very horrible. Whereas Barack Obama didn't seem as uh, rabid, uh, as warmongering, as warlike as Barack Obama. And I think it's true. Barack Obama is sort of a, a reluctant warrior. And as a libertarian, I think that all governments are bad, 
But if we have governments, and we do, I have to acknowledge that, they should each keep in their own area. They shouldn't go and fight with other governments because then you create havoc and you kill millions of people and the economy becomes more uh, centralized. The, the Federal Reserve, uh, the central bank uh, gains. So I would support Ron Paul on this. Uh, yes, sir. Professor, uh, besides the moral argument, the theft argument, which is important, but let's forget this for a moment. Uh, do you think that is uh, economically efficient to take money from rich people to help people that uh, don't have anything to eat or don't, don't have money to pay for education and for basic um, uh, service? What do you think about this? The question is, for, let's forget about moral issues for the moment, although moral issues are important, but just from an economic point of view, will, will there be more economic welfare, if I can put words in your mouth, if we take money from Bill Gates, who is very, very rich, and give it to Gabriel, who is very poor. Look at these lousy shoes. <laughs> He's very poor. And the argument is we have such a thing called diminishing marginal utility of money. What's diminishing marginal utility of money? It means that the first thousand dollars is very important to you because it's the difference between life and death. And the last thousand dollars that Bill Gates has is very unimportant to him. He uses the money to light his cigars. So if we take money away from Bill Gates, uh, just a thousand, we give it to poor Gabriel, Gabriel's wealth, welfare will increase markedly and Bill Gates' welfare will decrease just a little bit. And therefore, there's a, a gain. This would be the argument. The problem with this is twofold. First of all, it talks about utility, not ordinarily, but cardinally. What do I mean by this? Ordinal utility is ordering. I like vanilla ice cream better than chocolate ice cream. Fine. I like uh, the wristwatch more than the shirt. Fine. I like his shoes more than my shoes. Fine. This is coherent. Cardinal utility is I get 10 utils out of this watch and 5 utils out of this shirt, and therefore I like this twice as much. That's nonsense. Not that I'm against numbers, I mean, there are legitimate numbers, miles per hour, uh, Fahrenheit, centigrade temperature, uh, uh, speed, uh, velocity, all sorts of numbers are reasonable. But utils are not. There is no measurement of happiness. You can't say that this is 10 utils and this is 5 utils and therefore this is twice as much. The second error is not only are you making utils, but you're making interpersonal comparisons of utility. It's even worse to say that I like this at 10 and you like it at 5, and therefore I like this twice as much as you. Now you're making interpersonal comparison of utility between Bill Gates and Gabriel. So it's fallacious in two ways. This, this third problem with this idea is maybe Gabriel is a bum. Looks pretty bummy to me. And what he's going to do with this money, he's going to get drunk. Whereas Bill Gates can invent a new computer with that extra thousand. So maybe welfare would be better if Bill Gates keeps his money. Now, forgetting about the morality, but just the economics of it. And then if you take money away from rich Peter and give it to poor Paul, you reduce the incentives of both to earn income. Rich Peter says, why should I earn income? They're going to just take it away and give it to Gabriel. And Gabriel says, why should I work hard and get money? Then they won't give me money. So there are a lot of economic reasons why we shouldn't do this, in addition to the ethical reasons. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, why libertarianism is incompatible with conservatism? The way I see the, the question is, why is libertarianism incompatible with conservatism? A lot of people think that libertarianism is a branch of conservatism. The way I see it, it's like a, a triangle, uh, I think an equilateral triangle where each side is equal and the degrees are 60 degrees. Namely, you have liberalism, conservatism, and libertarianism. The three are very different. Conservatives are a little bit better on economics than liberals. Liberals are a little bit better on personal liberties like uh, legalizing drugs, legalizing sex, or gambling. And they're both horrible on foreign policy. 
Whereas libertarians are unique. We are different than, than both of them. Out of time, I guess. Does that mean? I yeah. uh, so I, I would say that the left-right spectrum is uh, not accurate. Rather, we should have a north-south spectrum. Or the, uh, what is that di uh, diamond? Uh, Nolan. Nolan. Nolan chart would be a better way. The problem with the Nolan chart is there's no foreign policy. It's now 45 minutes, and this serial murderer is gonna, <laughs> he's gonna murder me if I, if I don't shut up. So I'll shut up. Thank you so much. <laughs>